I use Twitter. My name there is English Paul M. And many times if I observe something that I dislike about Zoom or really any app on my phone, on my computer, I'll just put a complaint out on Twitter, hoping it inspires other people to say, I have that problem too. Let's work on it together. Welcome to 30 Years in 30 Minutes, the podcast that distills decades of wisdom and success into bite-sized, inspiring conversations. My name is Michael Ovid, the host of the podcast. Along with Terrence Gable, I sit down with the world's most accomplished individuals and hear their stories of grit and determination. How did they rise to the top? What is the key to their success? How did they overcome the obstacles that they faced along the way? You will learn all that and more on 30 Years in 30 Minutes. Paul English is the co-founder of the travel meta search engine Kayak, which sold for $1.8 billion to Priceline and which was later acquired by Booking Holdings for $2.1 billion. He also co-founded Lola.com, Moonbeam, Get Human, Intermute, and Boston Light. He is the founder of Boston Venture Studio, a startup to create consumer technology companies. And his nonprofit work includes the Bipolar Social Club, Summit Education in Haiti, Embrace Boston, and the Winter Walk for Homelessness. Paul, thank you for joining us today. It's great to see you guys. Thanks for having me on the show. Of course. So, Paul, I think the first question we all want to know is, what began your fascination with small boats? <laughs> Are you talking about kayak? <laughs> yeah. It's funny. When we um, we incorporated the company as Travel Search Company, Inc., known that was a placeholder, and then we hired a brand agency in New York led by a woman named Carol Costello to help us come up with a name. And we did, like, weeks of positioning and, you know, what aspirational, what we wanted to be known for and things like that. At the end of it, we went through like a hundred names, came up with five finalists. I will say that Kayak was our second choice, which is another story. I'll tell that in a minute if you want to hear it. But we went back to our board and we said, we just went through this brand exercise for the last six weeks. We're going to call it a big Kayak. One of my investors at General Catalyst said, you'll call this company Kayak of My Dead Body. That's the worst name for consumer traffic site. Everyone's going to think you're talking about a small bird. And um, I will say, being the good entrepreneurs that Steve, my co-founder, and I were, we said, thanks for the input. We're calling it Kayak. <laughs> That's funny. So I'm curious, I guess the first question, and we'll start with your free entrepreneurial life. What are the most important lessons and skills that you learned in your early and young adult life, either growing up in college or in your first few jobs, and how do you develop them? I would say the first thing that comes to mind is I grew up in a family of nine in a three-bedroom house in Boston and living, I think it was 1,300 square feet, and living in that type of circumstance without many people meant you had to be like hyper alert about what's happening in the home today, who's angry, who's crying, who's screaming, like who's mad at who. And it kind of trained us all to be a little bit of psychologists. Two of my siblings actually became psychologists. And I look at my career in tech, leading tech teams. And I think like probably at least 5% of my time is spent doing psychology. So that was the first thing about how teams work and how to get people working well together and listening to each other. That's the first thing that kind of comes to mind. And well, in high school, you also created a game called Cupid. Can you tell us about that and, and how that affected the way you think about entrepreneurship? Yeah, when I was in high school, my mom bought a Commodore VIC-20 computer for the family. I vaguely remember it cost $300 at the time. This is around 1980. And I quickly consumed the book. It came with the basic programming language. I learned that. And then started writing my own apps. And I learned how to do graphics and sound effects. And I designed this game, Cupid, which was really, for me, it was testing what I could do with graphics to try to do something that's really cute and animated and animation in particular, and then also what I could do with sound effects. And I sold it to a company called Games by Apollo, and I sold it for $25,000. And it was incredibly exciting for me to be a high school kid in the 80s selling a game for $25,000. And um, I think that is when I realized, like, I think I'm going to, I think there's something here, like that I, I can do things that are valuable. Do you recommend that aspiring entrepreneurs try to 
found something while they're in high school or, you know, prior to college, graduating college? Yeah, definitely. Either found something or help someone that's founding something. And it doesn't even matter what it is. I just had um, a guy that I'm, I don't know that well. I don't think I met him in person, but um, a guy I've been fr- very friendly with by email from a wildly different domain than tech. And he just sent a proposal that he's thinking about buying a laundromat. And he was asking for my advice on it. And like, I've never owned a laundromat, but I read the attachment. I read all the details on it. I was thinking that actually sounds kind of fun. And so maybe like a high school kid can get his friends together and say, let's go buy a laundromat or a cow wash or something and just learn how to make customers happy and how to make money. So I do think it's something good that people should do either on their own, try to build a product and sell it or help someone that's doing it. For people who don't have access to tremendous resources while in high school or or before they graduate college, how do you recommend they go about trying entrepreneurship? I will say that AI has changed everything this year. It's now possible. There's now low code or even no code solutions to let people build apps just by drawing pictures. It's really remarkable. And week to week, there's more and more advances happening with more and more tools and utilities and companies that are doing things like this. So I think it's pretty easy for people these days to build websites and to build apps. And I might start with that in high school. Just, you know, go to YouTube or go to Google or go to Bard or OpenAI and just type, how can I create a game without coding and look at what other people have done. Look for it on Twitter. I follow a lot of people on Twitter who post their discoveries in AI and it doesn't cost much money and you can create software pretty quickly these days. Even I look at my own company. So I've been running software companies for decades. And I'm looking at one of the companies I'm running right now. It's called Deets. It's a travel company, like show me the Deets. And we were able to replicate a kayak feature that kayak been working on for 10 years. And we built it from scratch with two engineers in three weeks. And our version actually works better than kayaks. And the reason we're able to build something that rapidly is AI wrote most of the code. So we had to write very little code to pull together a feature. It just, it's a lot easier to write tech now than it was five years ago or 10 years ago, or even one year ago. Paul, do you think you learned more from your form? Because you were obviously involved starting a lot of things prior to you know graduation. Do you think you learned more in your formal education or in your kind of self-taught education? And what skills do you think you learned from which thing? I will say formal education is important. A lot of people are dissing college and saying, you don't need college anymore. It's a big waste of money. And why go for four years and ended up a couple hundred thousand dollars in debt or whatever. You don't really need to do that. I do think when I read those arguments that it does open my mind that not everyone needs to go to college. And maybe some people should go to a two-year college, not a four-year college, because two-year colleges can give you basic skills to give you an entree, entree into certain careers. But when I look at my college experience, I studied music and computers And the computer stuff, you know, I learned how to build an operating system to write a compiler, to do graphics. That stuff did help me in my career, but it's really the working with other people that's the most important thing. So I took a software engineering course that taught you how to work with five students on one app that you job together. And in my working life, it's all about working with other people. So I think the collaboration It's like you need technical skills, but you also need collaboration skills. And they're underrated and really important. And you should get some of that at school and you should get some of it at internships and volunteer work. So you spoke about the importance just now of working with other people. And it's a common theme that we see, the importance of surrounding yourself with good people. I guess while in high school, while in college, after you graduate college and into your first job and and beyond that, how do you make sure... You surround yourself with the right people, people that are entrepreneurial, people that have drive, people that are intelligent. They say you're the average of the five people you spend most of your time with. So if you want to change your life, you just be really mindful, like who you're hanging out with. You know, if you're in college, you at bars every night drinking beer, like that's probably not going to get you along your life's journey if you have a journey. When I lecture entrepreneurship at different universities, I'll always tell people you need a mission statement for the company. But I also think as individuals, we each should have a mission statement and really think about it and talk about it with friends and 
it's okay to evolve it over time. But if you think about what your mission statement is, like what you want in your tombstone, the artist Banksy says, we all die twice. The last day we draw our breath and the last day someone mentions our name. So we think about like what we want on our tombstone and what we want to be known for. Then look at the people you're hanging out with and say, are they helping you on that journey? So the first thing is just be, be super selective and pick people that, you know, you want to make sure you're helping other people in addition to them helping you, but you want to be with groups of people that are walking the same path in terms of whatever that is for you, whether it's you want a spiritual path or you want to um, create businesses or create friendships, whatever your path is, surround yourself with people who can help you along that journey. There's many aspiring entrepreneurs who are working jobs, working many hours a day. How do you recommend or how can they take the leap of faith from working that job with a stable income to be an entrepreneur? Because it's a hard thing to do. The first thing to tell whether you should quit your job to go work on a new idea is, is your idea compelling enough and are you compelling enough that you can find two or three extraordinary people who will start work with you on the idea nights and weekends, even before you talk about compensation. If you can get really talented people to help you, you're on to something. Like that's the first litmus test. If you cannot get some talented people to work with you for free, it's one of two things. Either your idea is not actually that good, you know, the problem's not that big a problem that other people have, or you're not compelling enough as a co-founder. So that's what I'd recommend to make the decision is just keep pitching people. And when you find two or three amazing people who say, that's unbelievable, I want to work on that, how can I help you? Then you should quit your job. Paul, I got one kind of the inverse of what Michael's asking. How about if you're currently working an idea, how do you judge if you should, you know, say you're not getting immediate traction, it's not explosive growth. How do you judge if you can, should keep sticking on that idea versus moving, you know, either packing up and pivoting that idea or just moving on to another idea? Totally. So I'm running a vent, little venture studio right now called Boston Venture Studio. We have about four or five companies under development. And we have a core staff of eight. And then we have about 40 engineers offshore uh, through an engineering team I've worked with for 15 years. And part of it is literally the core team at the studio is incredibly, incredibly strong. And part of it is to see which people drift towards which companies. If the strongest people in the studios are all interested in one idea, one product, they keep working on it. We keep working on it. If people get bored or they get disillusioned or they start working on something else, we might abandon that product. But the other thing we look at is how effusive are the customers? Like one of our apps right now is a dating app called Lola Dating. It's Lola.com. And it just got released in Boston. Right now we're building up a wait list. We get tons of emails every day from people in Boston who read the pitch. They go to Lola.com. They read about what we're doing that we think is different than any other dating company. They love the pitch. They wow. give us feedback. They tell their friends about it. And that's a case where the early customers are telling us that there's something different here. Most startups don't get that much email, but the fact that we're getting tons of email every day means like we've struck a nerve. There's a lot of people who, who are now past college and I guess they're isolated to hanging out mostly exclusively with the people that they work with. How do people like that venture out of that isolation, venture out of that small circle into more entrepreneurial minded people. So that way they're able to hang out with, with those entrepreneurs or potential entrepreneurs. I think it's just networking and try to find people that like solving problems. They say that, you know, when you study um, jazz improvisation, most great jazz artists also, not all, but I would say most actually have good musical education and that they have mastered other musicians, jazz and even classical. And then they take that and learn from it, kind of make their own voice. Well, if you want to be an entrepreneur, learn from people that are already doing it and then find your own path. But it's important that if you want to be an entrepreneur, when you think about who you hang out with when you go out for coffee or whatever, just hang out with people that like talking about how can we improve this coffee shop? Like what sucks about this coffee shop? What can we do to make it better? 
and find people who enjoy having conversations like that and then have them on all sort of topics, but about improving, about taking something that came before you and how do you spin that and make it better and change things. And there are those people everywhere in all walks of life. Just go, go find them and spend a bunch of time with them. Paul, you know, you're involved in so many things and so many different ideas. If that's from your nonprofit, your venture studio, or, you know, things you're the CTO or co-founder of, how do you go about managing your time and what tips would you give to people balancing a busy schedule? Say if you're someone like Michael who's in college and, you know, doing stuff like this on the side. Yeah, I think time is definitely my most precious resource right now. And I have to be disciplined about it because... You know, like today, for example, I'm looking at my Google account right now. I have 12 meetings and it's not unusual for me to have, you know, eight or 10 or 12 meetings in a day. I also probably got about 400 emails a day and that's not including spam. I have pretty good spam filtering and I try to respond to those emails. But if you get a lot of opportunity around you and a lot of requests around you, one, you have to be really disciplined to say no a lot because only by saying no to some things can you then focus on things that are most important, the things you want to get really, really good at. And then the other trick I do is I color code my calendar. So everything is one of four colors. So yellow is nonprofit. I try to do about eight hours a week, sometimes more, sometimes less. Green is self-improvement. So whether that's going to Buddhism class, which I do on Thursdays in Cambridge, Mass, or um, going to the gym or anything around self-improvement. And then purple is my day job. And I try to restrict my hours. I try to have regular meetings only from 2 to 5 p.m. and occasionally from 10 a.m. to noon. But I need time off during the day to do work as well. So you can't do just meetings. And then uh, blue is everything else, sort of friends and family. And every Monday, Friday, my assistant, Eliza, and I look at my calendar for two weeks ahead and we make sure there's a balance in those four colors. And if there's a balance, like things feel really good to me. If something is missing, like I'm not working out enough or I'm not doing enough nonprofit work, which really like I work out for my soul, things feel off. Can you walk us through how you came up with the idea for Kayak and why it was such a success? Yeah, so Kayak was my second real company as an adult. My first company was an e-commerce company I sold to Intuit. And as I left into it, I first got a job as an EIR at Greylock. And then one day I was called over to look at a company that General Catalyst was looking at in Cambridge. And as I was leaving, one of the partners there, Joel Cutler, said, wow, what are you doing here today? There's a guy here named Steve Hafner. He's one of the founders of Orbitz, and he wants to create a travel company. Would you sit down and meet with him? I said, sure. So he introduced me, went down to Legal Seafoods, had a few drinks and he gave me the pitch and his original observation was at orbits about 70 percent of the people would do a flight search and then they would leave and go directly to the airline and book it it seems like that sucked because we did all the work and we made zero revenue so what if there's a way where we we made a travel site that didn't sell anything all we did was search and so he had the original idea for it and then we kind of riffed on it and Kayak did become known as a search engine that we had more content than any other travel site. But I think even more important than that, Kayak ultimately became known as a site which was very fast. I was obsessed with speed and it just worked much faster than any other travel site and had a nice UI. And that's really what we focus on was speed and user experience. And I think we got to the point where people, we, we've lost a ton of money in our first year or two because it cost us about a dollar to buy some of the kind of the website, and we made about 20 cents on average. But over those couple of years, we got the user experience and the brand to the point where we might have had to buy some to come to us the first time, but they'd remember us, they'd come back directly without clicking through an ad, and they'd tell their friends about us. So I think it was really when we perfected the brand and the user experience that things started growing rapidly. It's clear how you came up with your idea for Kayak, but there's a lot of entrepreneurs or people who want to be entrepreneurs, but don't have ideas. How do you recommend they come up with the next billion dollar idea or the next innovative idea to become a successful entrepreneur? They should try to figure out what problems a lot of people have. And I've always said, 
it's more important to select the problem you're working on than to think about what your V1 product might look like. Most tech companies fail for one of two reasons. Either there's a founder implosion and a toxic culture, which sadly happens all too often, so pick your co-founders carefully, or they build pretty good tech, but they build a product that solves a problem that people just don't care enough about. And I can't tell you how many times I've seen people start their journey to create a product. And I've said, I just don't think that's a big problem you're working on. And they spent years of their life and the life savings in some cases, and they built a product and no one used it or no one bought it. So I think the most important thing is just riff with your friends about what problems you have and those big problems do other people have it. Like I use Twitter. Um, my name there is English Paul M. And many times if I observe something that's really that I dislike about Zoom or really any app on my phone, on my computer, I'll just put a complaint out on Twitter, hoping it inspires other people to say, I have that problem too. Let's work on it together. So just be in the habit of just talking about problems you're encountering in everyday life. It could be, it might not even be tech. It could be problems related to senior care. Like you're trying to find some care for your parents, like grandparents. It really could be anything. Any problem you encounter in life, try to see other, other people have that problem. How big of a problem is it? Paul, do you have a specific way you gauge the metric of how big the problem is? Because it could be a problem to you know someone in me and my circle, but to really gauge if it, this is a problem that affects hundreds of thousands of people, millions of people, how do you go about doing that? Because obviously, if you know, you can go out and pay to have surveys done, but a lot of entrepreneurs when they're starting don't have that opportunity. How would you go about doing that initial research? You might think this is funny, but I do a lot of my research on Twitter. I'll create a Google form where I ask people and I try to make the form as obscenely simple as possible. I created a Google form the other day that said, what do you like about kayak? What don't you like about kayak? And I put it out on Twitter and I said, and I put it on LinkedIn as well. I said, hey, kayak co-founder here. I want to know what you guys think of it. And this is going to help me think about the travel company that I'm working on now. And I had a hundred people reply to that and fill out what they loved about kayak and what they don't love about kayak. And that was like really useful to me. So I think just doing online surveying is, is great, but then also making sure you're talking to people either on Zoom or on the phone or ideally in person and letting them talk about how they encounter the problem that you want to work on. As a serial entrepreneur, what do you think is the most important aspect of predicting success? Are you a good recruiter? Because if you think about the best people you've ever worked with in your career, and then the worst people you ever worked with in your career, like, don't you want to start a company with, with all people that are like the best? It reminds me, I put something out on LinkedIn recently and I said, every company has one person that's the funniest person in the company or the most fun person in the company. I want to hire all of them. Like, I'd love to have a company of 25 people where each of the 25 was the most fun person at their last company. Just think how awesome it would be <laughs> if a company like that. Um, recruiting, it's the most important skills. Find great co-founders. Find your first five employees that are all good storytellers and charismatic. They'll find you the next 50, which will find you the next 500. So recruiting is the most important skill. And then the second thing is storytelling. Storytelling is what gets us co-founders, gets us to employees, gets reporters to write about us, gets venture capitalists to throw money at us, gets customers to buy our products. So it's recruiting and storytelling. Those are the two I would pick. What well, the biggest tip you would be to someone who wants to improve at those skill sets? Because as you said, those are the most important things. You know, storytelling is one of those things that you actually can get better at. I'm a fan of anyone who wants to be an entrepreneur should take a class in improv comedy because improv is about how do you riff on each other's ideas and there's specific training you can get to be good at improv. And then also, if you go to YouTube and you type storytelling or how to be a good storyteller, you'll see a lot of amazing content there. Start observing people that you think are good storytellers, whether it's Steve Jobs and his reality distortion field or whoever, and observe them and don't copy them, but be influenced by them. Like just take little lessons from different storytellers. And there's things you can do, not just storytelling, but also if you want to be more charismatic, 
There's techniques you can learn to be a more charismatic person, which will help you tell better stories and help you convince people to leave their jobs to come work with you. And that's something you can read about as well. Based on your experiences, your successes, your failures, if you were to speak to an aspiring entrepreneur right now, what would you tell them to do to best prepare them to be a successful entrepreneur? I would say be a good person, be helpful to your friends. When you say you're going to do something, do it. You know, be a person who demonstrates that you get things done and just try to be all around helpful. I once worked with a guy named Kimbo Mundy many years ago at a company called Interleaf. And we had, I think, a couple hundred engineers. And Kimbo wrote software to try to predict who was the best engineer at the company. And I was fascinated with the problem at the time about how can software tell who's the best engineer? Like you can look at how many bugs you create, how fast you fix bugs. There's a whole bunch of things you look at. But um, one of the more interesting things that he came up with was how often other engineers say thank you to you when they write their release mail, when they check their code into the system. And when he came up with that idea, I thought about it. I said, you know, that's actually true. The engineers that are most helpful, that other people are at their desk asking them for assistance, those typically are the best engineers. So if you want to be an effective entrepreneur, just try to be a good person, try to help other people all the time. Paul, if you could boil your career down, what would your one life lesson be that you would pass on to the next generation of entrepreneurs? I think it was Maya Angelou who said, no one's going to remember what you said or what you did. They're only going to remember how you made them feel. I wish someone told me that when I was 25, the first time I was managing a team of engineers, because I think I was a pretty good engineer. But when I started managing engineers, I probably was a little bit harsh and judgmental. Like if there's someone I perceive as not fast enough or not prolific enough. And I look back at those years and I say, I wish I was kinder and I wish I motivated people with kindness and excitement. As I think about coaching myself, if I could go back, that's one thing I would tell myself is focus on the team. And on to the final segment of the interview, Paul, the rapid fire questions. When did you know that you made it? I mean, I've had several milestones. When I sold that game for $25,000 in high school, that told me I'm onto something here. I think I can produce stuff. I can create stuff. It's a value. And 25000 it may it could have been a million dollars. Like 25000 was so out of, out of reach for me. That was amazing. And then when I sold my first grown-up company for $30 million, I remember going home and explaining it to my parents that I just sold a company for $30 million. And they were like mystified. My dad was actually a little bit nervous. Like it didn't make sense. He didn't understand software. Why would someone pay you $30 million? You know, you're, <laughs> it didn't make sense. And I thought that was a big milestone. So I think those are the first two that come to mind. Paul, you're known for talking about recruiting and I've heard you and other things speak about, you ask people who's the smartest, who's the smartest person they know. So who's the smartest person you know? Oh my God. Um <laughs> I would say my kayak co-founder, Steve Hafner, is one of the smartest people I've ever met. And we had an absolute blast working together. We're both impulsive, maybe recklessly so, but we're both quick reads on people and we both just like making decisions rapidly. And that was an incredible fun 10 years of my life working with Steve. And... What is the best career move that you made and what is the biggest mistake that you made? It's one of two things. It's either when I sold my e-commerce company to Intuit and I decided to sell Intuit and not to others, there were other companies interested in us, including Amazon and then a couple other companies that have since gone out of business. And I feel very lucky that I chose Intuit because I learned so much there. I was there for four years and I studied Scott Cook a lot. He was the founder. So that was an incredible learning four years for me. And then at Kayak, I mean, the day I met Steve and within under an hour, we decided to be 50-50 co-founders creating a travel site. I mean, that obviously led to amazing things for me. And it was an incredible 10-year journey. Paul, last question here. What are three books you would recommend to an aspiring entrepreneur? Oh, that's interesting. Well, I feel like I should say stuff like is it called zero to one and the hard thing about hard things, you know, stuff like that. 
Paul Graham's writings. However, I would recommend not those books. I'd recommend books about life and philosophy and relationships. So things like, there's a book called Refuge by Terry Tempest Williams. And so Impermanence, which is something I learned through studying Buddhism. It's not really a book about Buddhism, but it's a book about what I would call impermanence. There's a book called Family Matters by a guy named Rohinton Mystery. And that's a story about family relationships. Then I also like My Experiments with Truth, which is an autobiography of Gandhi. Those are the first three that come to mind. So things about relationships and big picture and philosophy. That's wonderful. Well, Paul, thank you so much for your time today. It's been a pleasure to speak with you, to hear your insights, especially to hear the insights of somebody who's accomplished and done so much. So, well, thank you again for your time. We appreciate it. Thanks a lot, guys. Thank you for listening to 30 Years in 30 Minutes. Don't forget to like and subscribe and let us know in the comments if there's anyone else you want to hear from.